Have you prevented others from sharing the screen and things like that? Oh, it's fine. So everyone will see what is going to be. That's fine. Let's see. Uh, David, you don't mind we put as always on YouTube the recording. Okay. Oh, Perfect. Is it running on YouTube? Uh, I'm uh, checking it uh, right now. So. Okay. Yes, everything is fine. Okay, great. Игорь, а ты включил звук? Да, все нормально. Нормально все, да? Да, ну да. Просто Дэвид is waiting. Uh, as always. Ready, uh, whatever you are. Are late. Okay. They will join us. So, Дэвид. Mm -hmm. Again, a pleasure to have you here. I'm sorry for forcing you to act for extra work in seminars here. Okay, go, go ahead. Yeah. I will not give excessive details on calculations, mostly because I prefer to avoid uh, too complicated calculations and find shortcuts. But uh... Uh, can you also send your uh, transparencies to oh, uh, yes. the chat? That's right, that's right. Let me export them. Ah. 
how do I okay. I've not I've not learned how to get to the chat yet while sharing the screen. Okay. Do you see the screen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let me know when you're for me to start. You may start. You may start right now. Okay. So today I would like to give some details on how to compute the boundary Karal algebras that can be found in topologically twisted gauge theories. Um, in particular in situations where you have a three-dimensional theory, which is topological in the bulk, but has a boundary condition, which depends holomorphically, uh, which, which is holomorphic. So the correlation function depends holomorphically on the position of local operators, and you get the Karel algebra of local operators at the boundary. Uh, this is a setup which is already quite familiar in, in you know, real physics, meaning that, um, Whenever you have some gapped theory in three dimensions, which has Karel edge modes, you find a situation like this, where you have some Karel degrees of freedom living only at the boundary. Uh, the prototypical example of this is, is three dimensional Shell Simon's theory, which has boundary conditions which support typically something like a WZW model. Uh, more precisely, a given topological field theory might have a collection of holomorphic boundary conditions which support a variety of different Karel algebras. But all of these Karel algebras must have some common property, in particular the category of modules must have some common properties, because there are there are very there is a very close relationship between the categorical data that defines the dimensional topological field theory and the properties of the Karel algebra and its modules. Um, so, so, for, so for example, an example of this relation is the fact that the space of states of just some theory on a, on a Riemann surface is the same as the space of conformal blocks for the WSW model on the same surface. Uh, so similar things happen in the topological twist of three-dimensional n equal four gauge theories. As I was reviewing last talk, these three-dimensional n equal four gauge theories have two topological twists. Uh, some of the boundary conditions of these physical theories survive the twist up to some deformation and give rise to holomorphic boundary conditions. Um, I will, during the talk, I will also discuss very briefly something about three-dimensional equal true theories, although the three-dimensional equal true theories typically are not topological in the bulk after twist, because they only have an holomorphic topological twist. But there is one situation where they happen to be topological in the bulk too, and I will discuss it briefly. Okay, any questions? So I will start by a quick review of the holomorphic boundary conditions for Chesamon's theory. This is a relatively well known subject, but uh, it has some, it's very inst instructive, has some rather interesting features, and it provides important computational tools for the, for the uh, sort of twisted supersymmetry, twisted, twisted gauge theory setup. In particular, sort of half of the calculations I'm going to do will, will uh, be analogous to the calculations done in the physical Chesamon's theory. So Chesamon's theory is defined by the sort of first order action uh, with a property that the, so, that the equations of motions tell you that the connection is flat. This action is gauge invariant, although under large gauge transformations, it can shift by an integer. So an integer multiple of eight pi squared. Uh, so in order to get a, a good path integral, the coupling, the Chesamo's coupling has to be quantized. Uh, you can try to define the theory just using this action as it is. Uh, it takes a bit of care to regularize it. Um, but it's fine. This action is on the nose independent of the metric. It's only built by using wedge products of forms and integrating over space time. Although a little bit of uh, metric dependence 
comes in when you try to regularize the theory and gauge fix it. But it's just some, some minor framing anomaly. So this theory is essentially topological. Um, if you want to be precise, the, in, in a topological field theory, you usually would say the stress tensor vanishes because the theory is independent of the metric. In just some of theory, stress tensor doesn't quite vanish, but it's a local functional of the, of the background metric called the cotton tensor. Uh, it's important that so this, this, this as I was saying, this, this coupling, the level is quantized, and the low energy dynamics depend strongly on the on the specific value of this coupling. Uh, there are important non perturbative effects, uh, which yeah, you wouldn't see easily doing perturbation theory in, in, in K. Uh, for example, when you start the space of states or the theory on a surface. Is a, is a finite dimensional space whose so dimension depends sensitively on the level. Or if you look at a space of line defects of the theory, topological line defects, what's called anions in the condensate literature. Well, those are created in the UV by just introducing Wilson line for the theory. But uh, although you have infinite, infinite many Wilson lines labeled by representations of the group, um, in the infrared, you only find a finite collection of independent ones. And again, which finite collection do you find depends sensitively on the level. Um, if you don't like this sort of first order actions, you could add a Young Mills action. Uh, this would give you a theory which is not topological, and depends on the metric, but is gapped. It has a massive gluon, which at low energy would just go away and give back the topological field theory. But if you work with this sort of second order action, uh, Although the final results are the same, a lot of the definitions you need to use are different from the ones that I will have in the rest of the talk. So for the rest of the talk, just think about this first order action without the immune term. Any questions? Okay. Now, how do you define boundary conditions for just Simon's theory? Well, boundary conditions are supposed to be a locally defined Lagrangian sum manifold in the phase space classically. So classically, the phase space of the Chersamos gauge theory is a space of flat connections, modulo gauge transformations. Um, it has a symplectic form, which is written like that in terms of uh, holomorphic coordinates on space. So Z is a holomorphic coordinate on the two dimensional space, Z bar is complex conjugate. So a very natural sort of uh, choice of polarization of, uh, of Lagrangian sum manifold in the space space, uh, which is local, is to set, say, the antelomorphic part of the connection at the boundary to be zero. You also need to specify what you're doing for, with the gauge transformations. And it's natural to pick the Dirichlet boundary conditions, meaning that the gauge transformations go to one at the boundary. Uh, this is because the, the this action gives rise by give rise to a two-dimensional gauge anomaly at the boundary by anomaly inflow. And so choosing the reclaimer conditions is the simplest way not to have to worry about that anomaly. Uh, I will discuss some alternatives uh, later. And also, although the boundary condition looks strange, it's Lorentz invariance, invariant. Now you might feel uncomfortable having a complex combination of all the fields being set to zero while the other complex combination, the conjugate complex combination is let free. But of course, if you go in, in if you will rotate to Lorentz's signature, this is just something like A0 minus A1 equal to zero at the boundary. So it's a perfectly fine uh, Lorentz invariant boundary condition. It's usual when you when you go to Euclidean signature, the, the reality conditions on the fields are confusing. Any questions? Okay. So, uh, right, the standard law from, from this, this curve by Witten is that this sort of Carl de Reclay boundary conditions give rise to boundary Carl algebra, which is the WCW model. But this comes about in actually in a rather subtle way. So, semi classically, what sort of local operators do we find at the boundary? Well, the antelomorphic part of the connection has been set to zero. The holomorphic part is. Very, it's an interesting observable with the theory. 
because we have the recombinary conditions, so the gauge transformation go to one at the boundary, the holomorphic part of the gauge connection at the boundary is a gauge invariant quantity. So it's a good local operator of your theory. Furthermore, the equations of motion tell you that the A equal to zero, the connection is flat. And so classically, it satisfies the equations of motion of the four delta bar A, Z equal to zero. So if a boundary operator, which is classic, which is holomorphic, um, you can do just perturbation theory with Feynman diagrams to try to figure out what are the OPEs, so these boundary local operators. And you easily reconstruct uh, the Kasmudi OPE. Uh, so the OPE of true occurrence has a one over k, z squared term proportional classically to k uh, plus a, a j over z sort of term. Again, there is a structure, some structure constants for the Lie algebra. Now, this is the perturbative answer. It's almost the right answer, but it's wrong, meaning that the correct answer should be WCW model, which is not, this, not quite the same as a, as a collection of cosmodic currents. More precisely, when I say that I lo my local operator is this sort of current, what I mean is that the local operators at the boundary are polynomials in these currents and its derivatives. Um, the WCW model is missing some of those polynomials, uh, which are which you know which are sent to null vectors by the state operator map. Uh, this is quite reasonable in a in a unitary theory, to unitary in the unitary, unitary setup, and null vectors for the couple. But it's not just that. It's not just the decoupling of null vectors. If you have uh, a non-simply connected gauge group, you really get new boundary operators which are not built from elementary currents. For example, sorry, sorry, I'm a little bit uh, confused here. So when you say about this difference, is it the same as you mentioned before that some of the properties ca cannot be restored in perturbation theory? Yes. It's just the same, yeah? So yeah. basically the second line is just local information which you can get from perturbation theory. And now you are speaking about some just more tiny effects. Yes, I'm just asking the question, how do I actually get the correct answer? But uh, this second line is also correct. It's correct. But it's a perturbative answer, it's not yeah. a correct answer. Uh, I see, not complete, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's incorrect in two ways. It has too many polynomials for the currents, some should decouple, should, should become trivial, um, depending which ones depends on K. But also there should be extra local operators which are not built from the elementary fields, but instead are boundary monopole operators. For example, when you have a U1 car Simon's theory, at the boundary you find a U1 current, but you also find essentially vertex operators of integral charge for this U1 current. Uh, a prototypical example is U1 at level one, which I was supposed to have here as a line, but I, I must adopt it. If you have U1 at level one, uh, you get extra vertex operators whose dimension is one half and which behave like free fermions. And so the boundary chiral algebra is actually a, a chiral free fermion instead of being just a U1 current algebra. Uh, if you have SU2 gauge theory, all that you do is to sort of lose the, these null vectors in the, in the in the Kasmodi vertex uh, algebra. But you have SO3, again, you get the current, SU2 currents, but you also get an extra vertex operator, uh, which is not built from the currents. So, how could you go compute the correct answer? Well, one possible strategy is to use the state operator map. Instead of asking about the space of boundary local operators, we can ask for the space of states on an hemisphere which surrounds the boundary operator. So in the bulk, the state operator map relates local operators to states on a sphere surrounding the operator. When you look at boundary operators, um, you have your sphere sort of, instead of a sphere, you have an hemisphere. Let me just draw a picture. Uh, let's see if I can. So, Imagine you have your boundary, you have a local operator, and then you want to look at the space of states on a sphere, hemisphere, 
surrounding the local operator. So if an hemisphere, which essentially is a disk, is bound, and at the boundary, you set your boundary conditions. You find, and you try to find the, the space of states for the theory compatible on a disk. So in the case at hand, it means we have flat connections on a disk with current boundary conditions at the boundary. Now the, the actual boundary conditions don't matter very much because now we are talking about you know, this, this Z bar is sort of the, the, the sum of the connection along the boundary of the disk and the connection in time. So it doesn't really constrain the connection on the boundary of the disk. But the fact that you have the boundary conditions matter. Ah, sorry, I didn't realize that the annotations would stay slide after slide. So let me just erase it. Okay. Good. So uh, we have a flat connection on the disk, modulo gauge transformations, which go to one at the boundary. What space is that? Well, the most basic function on the space, the most basic way to parameterize the space is to consider the holonomy from some point inside the disk to the boundary. So let me do, let me do another picture. So we have a disk with, with, a, with a flat connection inside the disk and gauge transformations are forced to be one at the boundary. And we can take a point, take a point in the middle of the disk and consider the path order exponential all the way to the boundary. Uh, okay, no, I don't think writing this is gonna be a little bit of So you do the path order exponential along the, on a, on a, along the radial direction and you get an element of the group, which is a function of the position uh, along the boundary. So this G of T is the holonomy from the point in the middle to a point T at the boundary. So I have a map from the circle to the group, modulo gauge transformations, but the only gauge transformation I have here is just a gauge transformation at the origin. So the space is the loop group of the, the space of maps from the group to the, to the circle, from the circle to the group, which is called the loop group, modulo the action of the group from the right. Let me give an example. So suppose I, I look at the U1 gauge theory. I have maps from the circle into U1, which are maps from a circle to a circle, modular rotation. So I can say that I send, uh, you know, I send the origin on the circle to, 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 to one. Uh, so what, what sort of degrees of freedom I have? Well, I have an overall winding number, which is a topological quantity. It's an integer. And then I just said the Fourier modes for this map from the circle to the circle. Um, so I have my phase space as multiple connected components, each of which looks like, uh, you know, actual to the infinity, infinitely, you know, infinitely many co position and coordinate and, and momentum. When I quantize this, the winding number zero sector gives me just the U1 currents, uh, you know, the Fourier modes of the U1 currents. But the, but the sectors with non-zero winding number give me extra states, which are the, the sort of vertex operators of charge N for the current. And so the result is this uh, U1 at level K WZW model. Any questions? Okay. Why do you have to choose some point as the origin? Why is this point special? Oh, you could have picked any point and the result would have been the same. Uh, I guess you could have just also integrated from a point in the boundary to another point in the boundary. You'd have, you would obtain a function of two t's or two positions on the boundary, uh, satisfying some, some constraints. But at the end, you would have obtained the same space. This is just a convenient way to describe this space this phase space. So it's important, right? That if you look at the same theory on a, on a Riemann surface without boundaries, you get a phase space, which is a finite dimensional, typically 
com essentially compact uh, space. Um, whose quantization gives you some finite dimensional spatial states. Instead on this disk with direct boundary conditions, we get an infinite dimensional space space, which quantizes to an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, which is uh, the space of local operators uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this WGZM model. So it's the vacuum module of the boundary Karel algebra. Uh, this description makes it easy to find the state. It, you need to work quite harder to understand the OPE in this language, but uh, I will not be concerned with that for now. Now, quantizing this sort of real phase spaces is a bit of a chore, um, but something nice happens, which is this the phase space is secretly a Keller manifold. And so, uh, you can do this quantization better by thinking by, by using the methods of geometric quantization, uh, where essentially you have a phase space which is a complex manifold, and you just, you pretty much pick holomorphic coordinates as positions and anti-holomorphic coordinates as momenta. So your Hilbert space becomes roughly holomorphic functions, so better holomorphic sections of some of some line bundle uh, determined by your symplectic form. So in this case it's possible to recast this, this sort of loop uh, loop space into something called the fine Gassmannian, which is pretty much maps from the circle into the complexified group, holomorphic. Uh, sorry, Laurent, think about the Laurent, Laurent power, power series in the complexified group, modulo, Laurent poly, modulo uh, power series in the complexified group. Um, this is a very well studied space. Um, and so when you do geometric quantization, if you have some algebraic geometer available in some nearby office, you can ask him questions about space or sex or homophic sections or some line bundle on the fine Grassmannian. And he'll tell you that, or, or she'll tell you that uh, this is the same as the WCW vacuum model. So, a way to recover the WCW model is to take homomorphic sections or some line bundle of essentially Kate power or some basic line bundle on the fine gas manual. And using this technology you can actually understand the OP as well. So Bellingson and Dreamfield have developed some technology to think about uh, kind of algebra in this language. Um, the physical interpretation of the sort of calculations is that we are studying boundary monoclo operators. And which, which means there, there, are, there are local operators which are defined by imposing a certain singularity in the fields uh, at the point in the boundary, pretty much a direct singularity there. And these algebraic geometric methods turn out to be very helpful when you study twisted uh, supersymmetric gauge theories. Any questions? Why uh, why this is uh, the same this uh, this space is the same as uh, vacuum model of uh, Vesuvian So this space the fine Grassmannian is 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 not the same as the vacuum model the the space of section uh, right sorry you mean the space of sections yeah um well this is a question I would leave to. <laughs> <laughs> algebraic geometer. So I'm not saying that this makes calculations uh, easier for me. It's just that it, this this transforms the problem into a calculation we can I can ask somebody else about. Uh, but perhaps uh, somebody in the audience has a better answer. Actually, uh, I, I can give some answer, but I also want to ask a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe first an answer. So the answer might come from the fact that this affine Grassmannian is embedded into projective space of this WCW vacuum module. So it's some kind of similar to the usual Grassmannian embedded into projective space of verge power. So, well, of course, something to be computed, but this is, in a sense, an explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and my, my question is, so you, you mentioned that the billinson Dreamfield grassmannian play a role here, mm -hmm. but uh, do you, so there is also a line bundle 
on this Billinson Greenfield Grassmannian, similar way you have a line bundle on the affine Grassmannian, do you expect some meaning from the uh, space of sections of the line bundle on the Billinson Greenfield Grassmannian? Does it have does it have any physical meaning? I think it's something like this: the space of operators, uh, not at a point, but at a collection of points. So, um, you know, mathematic good mathematical way to think about operator algebras is the language of factorization algebras. Uh, so, perhaps you could confirm that the space of sections of a line bundle on the Benson Drinfield Grassmannian is a factorization algebra. It is definitely a factorization algebra. Yes. Yes and uh, uh, yes and so I mean this uh, space of section has a uh, has a vertex algebra structure and a vertex algebra structure is essentially the same as a, a as a factorization algebra structure and uh, one way to construct this factorization algebra corresponding to the vertex algebra is by just taking sections on the uh, on the balance and Greenfield corresponding and not not on the fine this one. Yeah, I have to say that one of my one of the first things in my to do list at some point is to understand in a physical language the sort of Bellison and Greenfield style constructions of vertex algebras as sections of sheaves on, on, the, on the configuration space of points on the curve or things like that. Um, they seem to be rather powerful te te techniques and I have no clue of how to understand them at the moment in terms of, you know, OPEs of some local of vertex operators. Uh, I, I would love to see a copper uh, somebody develop a proper dictionary between the physicist's perspective on vertex algebras and this sort of uh, shifty perspective on vertex algebras. Any other questions? Uh, well, maybe also a question. Uh, can you uh, say more precisely, what, do, uh, what is the definition of these boundary monopoles? So, so, so to define a, a monopole operator, what you do is you take a singular solution of your equations of motions, and then you require you do a path integral which requires a connection in the neighborhood of the, sing, of the singular point to approach this reference singular solutions up to gauge transformations. That's how you define monopole operators in, in the bulk. That's how you define uh, toothed operators in four-dimensional gauge theory. So here, what you need is some uh, some solution, you know, some reference solution of the of the equations of motion. Um, so, in a, in a non Chersamon theory, I would have just said something like, "Okay, take a uniform flux on an hemisphere surrounding magnetic flux on a hemisphere surrounding your." Uh, your boundary insertion. Um, but uh, in this situation, I would probably say something like, pick your favorite point in this LG over G. That's a classical solution on the hemisphere. Uh, try to sort of look at three dimensional gauge configurations, which is approach the point, are gauge equivalent to this particular point. Um, now, this is a classical definition is not great. Uh, a semi-classical definition sort of keeps into account the fact that you might have a variety of reference solutions that you might want to approach. And perhaps um, you want to find something like a, a, a nice Lagrangian like submanifold in, in the space of possible uh, solution to use. And at the end, you end up with a sort of quantization of the, of the loop space. So in this situation, sort of, it's, it's a bit tricky to separate the definition from the calculation. Uh, but but if, you, if you speak about quantum theory, then what are their quantum numbers? How they can be described? Well, the quantum numbers have to be com computed as well, but um, if you are in a U1 gauge theory, for example, because the, there is flux surrounding them and because the flux 
is a current for a global symmetry of the theory. These monopole operators carry carry this carry charge under the global symmetry. But in the non-abelian theory, they don't carry any specific quantum numbers that are different from the ones carried by uh, more conventional operators, but they still do exist. And they are important to the parameters too, uh, in a lot of situations. Now, I mean, the definition of the proper definition, both physically and mathematically of these other operators, I think is still an open question. Um, I was discussing with Kevin recently. So at the moment, right, the, in the definition of perturbation theory for quantum field theory is mathematically rigorous. But I don't think anybody has worked out in a mathematically rigorous way perturbation theory in the presence of a disorder operator. Uh, precisely because of the subtleties. So naively you say, I define it by imposing a singularity in the fields. But then you need to work a little bit harder because typically it's a singularity up to gauge transformations or there's a, maybe there's a family of singularities you can put there. And then you need to understand how to semi-classically quantize that space of possibilities. So, sorry, this, this is a very nice example where the calculation can be done uh, in extreme detail. But uh, there are other examples, for example, because of the, of the BFM construction, we know how to define half BPS monopole operators in three dimensional and for for H theories. Uh, and in that, that, I find that example interesting because you see. Because, because the data that kind of goes in defining those monopole operators is, is rather uh, is rather interesting. I mean, it's it's uh, it's not quite trivial. It, it requires thinking about the fingers manian again. So, I think it would be really it would be nice to know, uh, even for standard gauge theory, for you know, for dimensional. So, by, so for dimensional young meals for QCD, what are the possible tooth operators I can define in the UV? Even before studying the properties, just what are the UV complete tooth operators that can define any theory? What are the UV complete monopole operators? And at the moment, I don't think I know the universal answer to the question. So this was a bit of a long-winded answer, but. Um, any other questions? But right, so the, the simplest way to think about it is in, in a state operator map setup. These, these other operators are just non trivial connected components of, your, of the phase space on the sphere or hemisphere surrounding your point. Another example of these, these other operators are vortex operators in 2D. If you study a, you know, a circle valued scalar field in 2D and you look at the operators uh, of the operator algebra, you find operators which have winding, right? Operators with the property that the scalar field goes around a certain number of times as you go around your local operator. So in any dimension and depending on which kind of fields your theory have, you can find a variety of different sort of operators. Now, this Chersamos calculation happens to be secretly an example of a twisted and equal true gauge theory calculation, simply because three dimensional and equal true Chersamos theory is the same as the non supersymmetric Chersamos theory. Uh, I don't know what. Sorry, this was, not so, this was an auto correct. It was not supposed to be securely, it was supposed to be secretly. Okay, so in this situation, you're on an amorphic top topological twist of this three-dimensional equal true gauge theory, but it's secretly topological. And if you do the calculation of the boundary parallel algebra for the reclaimed boundary conditions in this three-dimensional true gauge theory, you find exactly the same calculation as this. But what's useful is that if you try to study the reclaimed boundary conditions for 3D and equal true gauge theories with matter, which are not topological, you can still compute the boundary parallel algebra in a similar manner, except that this line bundle is replaced by some Chief, which encodes the matter uh, boundary local operators. And so this is a nice example of what I was, of this 
sort of slogan I was proposing the previous time, in the previous talk, that you should use algebraic geometry to do calculations in this uh, twisted gauge theorems. Now, from the rest of, for the rest of the talk, I will focus on three-dimensional equal four theories. I will discuss the A-twist first and then the B-twist. So let me discuss the, 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 the A-twist to the simplest three-dimensional equal four gauge theory, which is just a, a, a collection of matter fields of hypermultiples. The hypermultiples are a multiple of an equal four supersymmetry, which consists just of scalar fields and and, and fermions. Uh, remember that dimension, this three dimensional equal four gauge theory has two SU two R symmetries, which combine into an SO4 rotating the four supercharges. I call them SU two H and SU two C. The fields in, in a hypermultiplex are a collection of scalars, which are a doublet of SU two H, and a collection of spinners, fermions, which are in a doublet of SU two C. When you do a supersymmetric transformation, it maps a scalar to a spinner, and it maps a spinner to a, a derivative of the scalars. The twist, uh, the topological twist, replaces the, the standard Lorentz transformations with the diagonal combination of the Lorentz transformations and this issue to see uh, asymmetry. As a result, the, the Lorentz quantum numbers of the fields change. The bosons don't change, they're still scalars in a, a situation tablet, but the fermions now are both spinners in space time and spinners in a situation C. And so the product of two spinners is a scalar plus a vector. So the fermions after the twist transforms as scalars or as vectors under rotations in space time. The supercharge now maps the scalars to the scalar. Uh, and, and maps the fermionic vector to derivatives of the scalar. And actually, you can simplify the theory a bit by throwing away the scalar and some of the scalars here. And what you're left is just some, some kind of a fermionic vector field, a fermionic gauge field. Uh, and this sort of supersymmetry transformation that maps the vector to the derivative of the scalar is just the, the usual BRST transformation of a gauge field, right? The uh, transformation sends a gauge field to uh, an odd uh, gauge transformation. In this case, it, it sends an odd vector into an even gauge transformation. So anyway, the make a long story short, the A twist of the free multiple gives you a chern Simons theory uh, of fermionic gauge fields. The, the chess Simons action comes out very naturally just on the kinetic standard kinetic term for the gauge field for the firm, for the fermions. So you know as you go from psi del bar psi to the dagger psi, sorry, not the dagger. Uh, what I mean is that the, the fermions are the first of the action, and after you do this uh, redefinition of the Lorentz symmetry, it becomes a chess Simons action, something like psi the psi. Any questions? Okay. So, which boundary conditions, which kind of holomorphic boundary conditions can I have? Well, you know, this is a transamos theory, so it's not difficult to guess that I will have, you can find some holomorphic boundary condition which gives you a WCW model for this transamos action. And indeed, if you take some directly boundary conditions preserved in certain half of the supersymmetries and you modify them a little bit to make them compatible with the A twist, uh, you end up with the standard Carroll boundary conditions for directly boundary conditions for the fermionic Chessamos theory. And so the boundary Carroll algebra is just the WCW model for this fermionic uh, Lie algebra. Uh, essentially, you get a bunch of fermionic currents with an OP, with a very simple OP. Uh, notice, of course, this, this boundary parallel algebra is not unitary, as it often happens when you have topological twist of gauge theories. So you have fermionic objects which transform as currents. Sometimes this, this sort of Carl algebra, well, okay, I, I call this, this vertex algebra a vertex algebra of fermionic currents. 
you can think about it as a PSL11 um, WCW model. Uh, any questions? I mean, I should stress that, you know, this is not a mysterious result. You can just literally write down the, the boundary conditions in the, even in the physical theory and look at OP and find something like that. Um, this is sort of just the boundary. You can think about this just as a boundary propagator between two boundary local operators. Adding gauge fields, it, it's doable. Uh, it's a bit of a more complicated, complicated calculation, but it's doable. So the gauge fields in Tarian equals for theory is leaving something called the vector multiplet. It has bosons which are gate the gauge field and some adjoint scalars, assuming a vector of, of this institute C. And then fermions, which are spinners of doublets of all the institutes, some gauge genus. After twist, there is a bit of a reorganization. Uh, Kevin is an expert in this sort of manipulations. Um, and the result, the final result is again HS Simon's theory for some funny superly algebra. So the old gauge fields combined with the scalars and with the uh, with the matter fields to give you a, Lie a gauge algebra which has bosonic part, which is the Lie algebra plus its dual, and a fermionic part, which is just whatever representation the upper multiples of the gauge group did the upper multiples and so many. Um, I should perhaps say, so see, the upper multiples are a doublet of SC2H. So they also transform in some representation of the gauge group. Uh, so if a representation times a doublet and you impose a reality condition, um, you get you get a, a symplectic representation of the gauge group. So the representation, the multiples always transform in some symplectic representation of the gauge group. And this is this arc that I have here. Uh, the structure of constants of this auxiliary super Lie algebra can be written down, down just in terms of the, the structure of constant of the Lie algebra and the action on the on the representation. So you know, G acts on everybody else the, the obvious way. The only non-trivial transformation is the anti-commutator of two fermions, which before turning on gauge field was just zero. Now instead is something proportional to the moment map. It's a sorry. Now it's proportional to these new bosonic generators. Any questions? So the, the simplest example of this is a, is a U1 gauge theory coupled to one hypermultiplet. Then you get two bosonic generators from U1 and U1 dual, and two fermionic generators. And if you stare at the algebra for a while, you'll recognize U1 slash 1. There are also some Chen Simons, Simons levels that I didn't write down. But basically, the action classically has some pairing between G and G dual some pairing between R and itself using the synthetic form. And then there is some quantum corrections, which are which have the form of standard and Simon's couplings for G. And so there are some boundary conditions, the form boundary conditions in the physical theory, which become chiral from the boundary conditions for the super algebra. And so the boundary chiral algebra is just a WCW model for the super algebra. Again, perturbative, you find that you just find a super Casmodi algebra at the boundary. But non perturbatively, you need to figure out what the WCW model is for this super Lie algebra. So you need to really take the analog of this affine Casmanian for the super Lie algebra and study the space of sections of the line bundle or things like that. And I have to say that unfortunately, uh, this has not really been done in many examples. But I convinced myself at least that in simple that so I mean I learned how to deal at least with some simple example like this U1 plus hyper plus hyper that I mentioned. So you get the U1 slash one WCW model at level one. And there is some 
some story which is very similar to what happens for E1 and level one. So there are monopole operators which now transform as a free fermion or as a bosonic analog of a free fermion, a free bosonic spinner in 2D. Uh, and the whole WSW model reduces to just the product of this free fermion and this free uh, bosonic spinner, which is also called symplectic boson sometimes. Uh, and this, this can be used to find a very nice example of mirror symmetry, because this E1 gauge theory plus one hypermultiplet has a sort of a particle vortex duality, which relates it to a free hypermultiplet. So the A twist for this theory should match the B twist for a free hypermultiplet, which I'll describe momentarily. And indeed, the boundary vertex algebra is much nicely. So things that I would like to see done uh, and have not been done. So I would like somebody to do the calculation for that tells me what the WCW model for this super Liadra is in general. I would like to have some concrete description, you know, vertex operators or PEs for a large class of examples. For example, it would be great to know the answer for all linear quiver case theories or ADE quiver case theories or the ADHM quiver. And in all of these examples, one could try to verify mirror symmetry or study the properties of this vertex algebra. So, in a sense, uh, right, let me go all the way back. Right? In the physical setup, when you study chiral edge modes of some topological field theory, there is an important flow of information in both directions. Sometimes knowing the topological field theory gives you predictions about the properties of the vertex algebra. Sometimes you use, use, you use non vertex algebras to study topological field theory. Indeed, the very, make, the very mathematical um, structures that we use now to describe topological field theories in three dimensions uh, were developed originally by Cyber, by Cyber and Moore in studying rational conformal field theory. These twisted integral force supersymmetry examples are a non unitary generalization of that story. You have some not unit, non unitary topological field theories and non unitary uh, boundary kernel algebras. And you can use one to learn about the other. For example, the, the, the original motivation for me to introduce these boundary kernel algebras was for application to geometric Langlands. I would like to be able to compute the space of states for an A twisted gauge theory on a Riemann surface. Uh, and to be able to describe the spatial states in a concise way. And I believe that describing this conformal blocks of a bundle kernel algebra is a, good, is a good technique. So I would like to see more calculations done for this, for this uh, setup. Any questions before I go to B twist? Uh, there was a question in chat that I have tried to answer. Uh, I don't see the chat. Can you read the question? So the question was, uh, 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 what are the uh, subscripts uh, C and H? And I answered, uh, answered that uh, it was uh, Coulomb and uh, Higgs. Sorry again, the Coulomb. The question was, uh, what are the subscripts uh, C and H? SU2 C, SU2 H. Yes. Ah, right. Uh, indeed. So this is SC2H rotates the hypermultiplet scalars whose expectation values parameterize the Higgs branch of the theory, hence SC2H. Uh, SC2C rotates the scalar fields in the vector multiplet whose expectation values uh, parameterize the Coulomb branch of the theory, together with expectation values of monocle operators. So SU2C SU2 acts as, a, uh, as an isometry of the Coulomb branch, which rotates its compass structures. And SU2H acts as an isometry of the Higgs branch, which rotates its compass structures. Any other questions? OK, so let me go to the B twist. Now, in the B twist, let, let me look at first at the, the hypermultiplet example. So now I'm using SC2H to test the theory, which means that now my bosons, my scalars become spinners. 
and the fermions remain spinners. So now I have a collection of spinners of boson and fermions, both transforming as spinners of, of the Lorentz group. If you write down the equations of motion uh, of this theory, it just suddenly can be cast as a gradient flow equation for a certain functional. Uh, so you can write things like the you know, time derivative of, of z bar equal to del bar z of z. Uh, the reason this is useful is that um, we then developed a whole collection of tools that can be employed to study certain deep loss one-dimensional theories whose equations of motions are creating flows of an homomorphic functional, like a like pseudo potential. Essentially, you observe that the deep loss one-dimensional path integral on a half space simplifies and equals a d-dimensional path integral whose action is dysfunctional. Uh, this d-dimensional path integral is a bit funny because it has in is not made on a standard integration contour, at least not necessarily, but rather on integration contours determined by the boundary conditions at infinity for this d plus one dimensional uh, path integral. So we then used this originally to study analytic continuation of Chen Simon's theory. So he was studying a four dimensional theory with great equations of motion of the gradient flows of Chen Simon's functional. And so this allowed him to study. Uh, Chen Simon's theory with non trivial integration contours. Here, uh, we are using it to study a three dimensional path integral in the presence of boundary and claim that it's the same as a two dimensional path integral with this simple action. Uh, so it is supposed to be a superscript B. Uh, excuse me, who is omega AB? It's a synthetic form. Where? Uh, so remember that the hypermultiples transform in symplectic representations of the of the, mm -hmm. of the gauge group. Thank you. Right. Essentially, this Z is one of the two components of this doublet. So the, the, the hypermultiple, if you think about the hypermultiple scalars, is something like a Z A alpha. And this is Z A plus. Uh, while ZA minus is complex, con complex conjugate. So, because we can reduce the three dimensional path integral with the boundary to a two dimensional path integral with an action, which is essentially the action of a free fermion, except that these are bosons, uh, we discovered that the boundary chiral algebra of this B twisted hypermultiplet must be the, the algebra of these symplectic bosons. So you have OPEs that go like one over Z and so on and so forth. Um, now for, for later purposes, we can add on top, you can modify this boundary condition a bit by adding extra two-dimensional degrees of freedom, which are decoupled from the, from the bulk theory, such as extra chiral fermions. I mean, once you have these chiral bosons, why not? Um, so these are the sort of vertex algebras you find for a free hypermultiple. Yeah, gauge fields, the story is not that different. Yes? Uh, so I wanted uh, to ask, is there a statement that uh, chance is, is this uh, chance Simon theory uh, reduces uh, to this uh, two dimensional uh, action? No, 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 sorry. I was, I was, uh, no, I was, it's a different analogy. So I have the B twisted hypermultiplet, which is not a chance Simon theory, and it reduces to the two dimensional action. Uh, what, I was, what I was mentioning is that Witten used this just set up originally to, to study a four-dimensional theory, which reduced the boundary to a chance Simon's theory. Here I'm using to study this between hypermultiplet, which reduces the boundary to the synthetic bosons. Thank you. So, in a sense, the, the three-dimensional B-twisted hypermultiplet controls the integration contours. For the theory of synthetic bosons. See, the theory of synthetic bosons, although looks very similar to the theory of a, of a Carroll fermion, uh, is not quite an absolute theory. A Carroll fermion is an absolute theory. It's a true theory. It exists as a two dimensional thing without any reference to an hyperdimensional setup. The theory of synthetic bosons, instead, is a relative theory because it has conformal block, it has more than one conformal block. 
And so uh, it, the space of conformal blocks of this two-dimensional theory behaves as a space of states of a three-dimensional theory, which is this B-twisted hypermodulant. So this, this a theory with this action would not exist on its own, can only exist at the boundary of a 3D theory, which is a bit twisted type of multiplet. Now, so, so, sorry, is, is it true that uh, we are also restricted uh, in the sense that we can consider only some uh, boundary operators uh, in the initial uh, theory? In, in a sense, uh, can we compute some correlator of uh, fermions uh, sitting uh, on, on the boundary uh, of this initial idea that we start to... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I thought that thought thought this, this ZA is going to be some component of the scalar fields or the physical scalar fields at the boundary. So taking the fit, you're, you're taking the hypermultiplet and giving it Neumann boundary conditions for the scalar fields. So the value of the scalar field at the boundary is a good local operator. And the holomorphic piece of that uh, with these boundary conditions uh, happens to have OPEs that go like one over Z. So there is a boundary propagator, which is one over Z. Uh, excuse me. So uh, it looks like some sort of uh, beta gamma system. Yes. Or... It is. And Extended uh, beta and gamma are both spin one half. Here, beta and gamma are both spin one half. Yes. And that is what you uh, what you say uh, what you call by spinners. Uh, yes, synthetic bosons. I see. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, right, uh, so, I, sorry, and I also missed what you say that this theory cannot exist by itself, and uh, which theory uh, cannot exist by itself and only come from three three D. The synthetic bosons. I mean, it, it's a bit of a subtle matter. If you put synthetic bosons on a uh, on a Riemann surface, for example. Uh, which has an even spin structure, everything is fine. You get a unique conformal block, uh, no problem. But if you try to put them on a surface with an odd spin structure, then you get a zero mode. And a bosonic zero mode is, more, is troublesome. It's more troublesome than a fermionic zero mode. Uh, and and it, 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 it ends up giving rise to non-trivial conformal blocks. Uh, especially if you start coupling these synthetic bosons to uh, flat con to to, sorry, to bundles on the on the surface. So it's it's a very mild thing. This is almost okay as a two D theory. Um, it, the 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 this issue of conformal blocks is very is very limited. If you do things in the most naive possible way, you get just one conformal block or no conformal blocks, if you have zero modes. Uh, but if you start working in the derived sense, uh, you really keep track, not just the conformal blocks, but uh, obstructions to, to the existence of conformal blocks and so on. Uh, then you get interesting, interesting uh, complexes, which, which uh, match the spatial states of the B-twisted hypermultiplet. So when, when I say it doesn't, cannot live on its own, it's, it's a bit perhaps too strong of a statement. After all, we do use beta gamma systems occasionally, um, but they do have, they do have subtleties. Um, right, so you get non-trivial conformal blocks. You might be able to pick in a given situation, a specific conformal block, which is invariant under, which is sufficiently canonical that you can treat this as a, as a true theory. But it really depends on what you're doing. And you need to be you need to be way more careful than you are with just fermions. Okay. Now, if you add gauge fields, uh, you need to be a bit careful because uh, you risk having a gauge anomaly. But usually, you can add a bunch of cutoff fermions to cancel it. 
Uh, and then the, the final answer is that it's sort of a very steered action of the synthetic bosons from the hypers or the auxiliary fermions that cancel the gauge anomaly and a BC system. Um, it's, it's sort of, you get the sort of standard VRST uh, current, something of the form, you know, CJ plus BCC. So again, everything is in principle well understood. You know the algebra, you need, you know how to take a VRST reduction. Um, if you do it, say for this favorite theory, for you want theory, you want a separate multiplet, the BRST reduction actually gives you fermionic currents. So you get two nice examples of mirror symmetry. If you take the B twist of this theory, you get fermionic currents, which was the same as the A twist of a free hyper. If you do an A twist of this theory, you get a synthetic boson times a, times a complex fermion, which is a reasonable answer for uh, the B twist of an hypermultiple. So, you know, baby examples of mirror symmetry work out nicely here. Now, the same, same as for the eight twist, it would be nice to do more calculations, produce large classes of examples of these Carl algebras from B twist to gauge theories, verify mirror symmetry, do propagation to geometric lang uh, In general, see if this can be used as a tool to learn about uh, logarithmic vertex algebras, for example, that uh, we might, or, or vice versa learn about the, the B-twisted theories from the from the Carl algebras. Uh, okay, I'm more or less done. So I gave you the two recipes that you can use to compute A-twist a or B-twist Carl algebras. Uh, there are some small variations that can be applied to get uh, more general or morphic boundary conditions for the same bulk theories, but they are pretty minor, for example, you might have multiple choices of auxiliary fermions to cancel anomalies. You might try to throw in uh, uh, here in this setup, sorry. Yeah. In, the A, in, the A, in the A twist setup, you could try to uh, modify these boundary conditions to get dream free solo so called reductions of these WW models by replacing the entire boundary conditions with kind of, some kind of over boundary condition. Uh, you don't really get much new. Um, okay, any questions? There were a lot of questions during your talk. So if, I just want to thank you again for your talk and good luck. Sorry? Thanks. If if there are no questions, then just thanks you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.